one of my other previous duty stations was New Orleans, and we actually evacuated when Hurricane George came through. Uh, so I, I really tend to take this job a lot more seriously. Um, we'll often hedge on the side of caution just to make sure people are aware. I'd rather have people ready to move and not have to move than to have people going, well, maybe it's not going to hit us, and all of a sudden it decides to change its mind and come into town. Even though Norfolk is seldom hit with the full force of a hurricane, that doesn't mean it escapes major impact. In 2003, Hurricane Isabel made landfall in North Carolina, still packing enough punch to cause considerable damage in Norfolk. Tropical storm Katrina barely gained hurricane strength when it made its first landfall north of Miami. No one yet knew it would become the monstrous storm it would grow into once it got over the warm waters of the Gulf of Mexico. Forecasters make it clear. Hurricanes are complex systems, and they all hold surprises. The first after effect of Katrina on the American mainland was high water, and not enough of it to require Florida National Guardsmen to be on the streets. Only a handful of them wound up being called to duty. But only three days later, Katrina would make a second landfall and gain the full attention of the nation, requiring a massive response from the Department of Defense. Just ahead on recon, what does it take to rebuild after a devastating hurricane? We'll look at a base that's still recovering from a storm in 2004. Cleanup and rebuilding in this area will probably take many years. A lesson in how time-consuming that process may be can be taken from the Naval Air Station in Pensacola, Florida, that was in the path of Hurricane Ivan last year. Ivan, like Katrina, a Category 4 hurricane, made landfall about 10 miles to the east on September 16, 2004. The eye wall, the dense cloud surrounding the eye, which has the highest velocity winds of the storm, passed directly over the base. As you can see, the entire roof was blown off the building, plus uh, up to eight to nine feet of a tidal surge that came in from across the bay and flooded the ground floor. So it was a, the building was a complete loss. We lost up to 50,000 trees during the storm. You can see the where the ridge begins to go up to those homes up on the hill, uh, the tide line, uh, the debris line was halfway up that hill. When we, when we topped it that morning, this was a lake. This was all uh, standing water down here. The other thing we had to be careful of were snakes. We had uh, the count, last count I know of, uh, there were over 600 uh, poisonous snakes that, uh, that were killed during the time while they were cleaning the debris up. Commander Bo Stewart rode out the storm in the base emergency operations center. As daylight broke and the winds were down to a safe level, the CO made the decision to go ahead and see what the damage was. Uh, as we came out of the building, the first thing we had to do was cut our way out of the firehouse because uh, trees were down. Where we're standing, there were pine trees down across the road. Uh, all the way out, plus power lines down. We weren't sure uh, what the power situation was. It's the worst thing that I have experienced in my life. Uh, I assisted in Scambia County Sheriff's Department after Aaron and Opal over at Pensacola Beach. And unless you do experience it firsthand and you see it, pictures don't have, they don't even come close to what the devastation actually is. There's been an American naval base here since well before the Civil War. Today, it's home to the Blue Angels aerobatics team and a training base. A year after Ivan, the storm's destructive power is still evident throughout the base. Captain's Row, where senior officers traditionally lived, remains uninhabited, a ghost town. A high water mark is still clearly visible inside what was the base commander's house. We have two of the oldest hangars. Uh, in the Navy that are here, building 73 and 74. And uh, if you look to the south here, you can see this ramp where uh, uh, aviation, naval aviation, got started right here. And uh, seaplanes were uh, landing in that bay, Pensacola Bay right here, and coming ashore, and that's where it all got started in 1914. So rich history, and uh, it's worth saving, it's worth recovering from, and uh, that's what we're doing.
the estimate that we initially provided a couple days after the hurricane was 530 million in facilities damage. Commander Ron Crumps is directing the demolition and reconstruction. With so much damage, just negotiating the contracts is a time-consuming process. It takes time to develop the contracts. We have to put together specifications uh, that can be bid on by contractors. And there's a lot of work up front in interface with the contractors to make sure they understand the work. And then we evaluate their proposals and get the work contracted, get the work awarded. Commander Crump says the process will be going on for another year and a half. We're on track, well underway, to repairing all the facilities. We're going to have enough funds to repair all the facilities. And we're going to demolish some of the facilities that are excess footprint. Ivan's footprint is still evident off base. Pieces of private homes miles from the Naval Air Station wound up there. For many military people and civilians alike, the memory of that night remains vivid. The first time that the uh, wind gust shook our three-story building, uh, I got scared. And then the next two times, it was old hat, I guess, because I figured if I was going to go, I was going to go. It didn't matter. We lost power about 8 o'clock at night, and uh, it sounded like a 747 on top of the house the whole night through. And uh, we had several major uh, tornadoes go back behind the house, and you could hear them falling and ripping and tearing out the trees. The wind was so strong, it was so fierce. It does, and well, where I live in Gonzales, we had a twister come through. So you've always heard it sounds like a train. Well, it sounded like a train. <laughs> And like I say, it sounded like an elephant on our roof because it was ripping the shingles and the tar paper off. And I mean, it was loud. It was very loud, very loud. And we have a brick home and our roof wasn't even but about eight years old. But guess what? It got gone. <laughs> it sounded like a train. I mean, it was, it was very loud. You could hear a lot of the transformers blowing up outside, a lot of wind naturally. Uh, could see every once in a while in the lightning, some of the trees would be swaying real good and then all of a sudden start snapping. It was, it was intense. Sergeant Adams and other National Guard soldiers from Pensacola rode out the night in their armory. The building suffered damage that still hasn't been repaired. But there were guardsmen on patrol as soon as Ivan passed. National Guard were first on the scene and they're heroes to everybody that lives in Pensacola. Uh, the unit that we had in particular was charged with traffic control in our area and literally there are two or three thousand traffic lights that are not operating for, for months after Hurricane Ivan. The National Guard was on the scene directing traffic, helping people that were very frustrated. They were doing everything. They were <coughs> directing traffic, they were passing out food, they were giving out ice, they were I mean, you name it, they were on every street corner. Everywhere you turned around, you could see just truckloads and truckloads coming in. It was awesome. Very good, very good response. Where we lived looked like a war zone. I mean, it was terrible. It was just terrible. So many trees, you couldn't even pass out to get out of our neighborhood. But they were directly out there passing out the MREs, is that what you call them? The MRE foods and the ice and all that. They were over at one of the high schools right near us. They were issuing out water as well as ice. They were also manning all the major uh, roadways as far as the lights. We had a problem with electricity being out for many days, and they were a wonderful asset to the community as well. The summer of 2004 was challenging for the Florida National Guard. The state hadn't been hit by a landfalling hurricane since 1999. Then, in the span of six weeks in 2004, came four hurricanes and a fifth out in the Caribbean that brought heavy weather. About 2,000 Florida Guardsmen were on federal call-up deployed to Iraq. The Floridians weren't short of manpower, but they did need equipment. They made it through with a loan of Black Hawk helicopters from their National Guard colleagues in Georgia, Mississippi, Pennsylvania, and Connecticut. Last year was hopefully very unique. We, we did about four and a half hurricanes, and uh, there hadn't been another state that had been hit by four major hurricanes since Texas in 1886 and we hope uh, someone else doesn't have to do that for another 120 years.